Well, I'm excited this morning to um, begin a new series. We're going to be jumping into the book of Ephesians together. And uh, I mentioned, in, uh, I, I intentionally started where I started last week with the intention of um, uh, launching off in this series going through the book of Ephesians, because many of the things that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus and for us, um, we will see addressed all throughout this epistle. And so... Um, we're going to be spending a number of weeks, months, years, I don't know, um, however long it takes uh, not to get us through uh, Ephesians, but to get Ephesians through us. That's what we're looking to do, that, that God, the Holy Spirit, would open the eyes of our, underst- of our understanding, that we would see Jesus uh, clearer and see ourselves clearer. And so we're going to take a field trip to discover this in- incredible book in the New Testament that was penned by the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and preserved over these years so that we can learn how to navigate this thing called Christianity in a world that is far from God. So I want to encourage you this week, these next number of months, as, you're, as you engage in your own regular Bible study, I want to encourage you to incorporate as much of um, the book of Ephesians into your, your reading. Let's saturate ourselves in the book of Ephesians so that uh, in addition to what uh, you hear on Sunday morning, the God, the Holy Spirit can open your eyes to these truths. And, and, I, and I really believe that um, we will grow as, as a body. And so that's what really what we're looking to, to do. Uh, you know, to really grasp the, uh, the essence of what Paul is writing in the book. You know, sometimes we, we hear about the book of Ephesians and we just think it's this like archaic book that's disconnected from everything else that's going on, but that's not the case. Paul is the writer of this, this letter, and really it was a letter that he had written to a church in Ephesus and that has been preserved for us to learn from. And if we want to be able to really grasp all that it has to say and learn how to apply that to our lives, um, because there was a reason why it was preserved, right? It wasn't just preserved as history, but it's also preserved so that we can live this out. And so if we want to really get the truths of what it's teaching is we need, to, we need to understand the context of this writing, right? That's critically, critically important. And so how do we get the context of the book um, of Ephesians? Well, first, obviously, we consider who is the author, right? We, we want to know who is the one that's writing this book. We want to consider who the audience is, right? There was, a, there was an intended audience that caused Paul to write this letter, and so we want to consider this audience. We want to consider the time in which this letter was written, this time period, and, and you know, consider the things that were going on in the world at that time that, that, the, that the writer is addressing to the church, we want to consider the events that are, that are surrounding this, this time, right? Who, who's in charge? Who's the king? What's the, what's the, climate, the climate like at that time? And um, what was the purpose of the letter, right? There's always, a, there's always an intended purpose of these letters. And so we want to kind of get the big idea of what Paul is trying to communicate to the church in Ephesus, right? And then we want to look and see how does this, this message, this overall message, how does it flow harmonious, harmoniously with the other writings in the Bible? And so when we understand that, we apply those things and we do a little studying and understanding, it helps us to really unpack and receive the full content of what we are intended to receive. Too many Bible studies are um, approached kind of like, you know, like the Bible roulette. You know, you kind of open the book and you just, you know, here's where we're going to start, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. And it's like, did you know all this other stuff took place, you know? And so and what ends up happening is people come up with different theologies and different understandings of God and, and different perspectives because they're not reading the scriptures in the context in which it was written. Context is critically important when interpreting the Bible. It's extremely important. A text without a context is a pretext, right? A text without context is a pretext. And I see a lot of that. A pretext is when we take a passage of scripture out of context in an attempt to make it say something that it was never intended to say but it proves our point or it justifies our behavior or it condones our actions. And so we kind of take the passage out of its context and say, see, here's what it says. Well, that's not really what it says. And I know I don't like being taken out of context. Do you like to be taken out of context? 
right? Nobody wants to be taken out of context. God doesn't want to be taken out of context. And so when we, when we do that, we run the risk of going into dangerous territory and coming up with draw, and drawing conclusions about lifestyles and actions and behaviors and all these things because what we did is we wanted to, uh, we wanted to have the Bible justify what we're doing instead of the Bible informing the way we are to live our lives. And so the only way we can kind of get there is we gotta take text out of context and that never, never works. And then what ends up happening is when what we put in motion crashes and burns, it's God's fault. God abandoned me. God didn't meet my expectation. Why didn't he do it? And it's like, no, 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 you, you, you took something that God didn't say and said God said it and you ran with it. And God's like, I never said that at all, right? And so it, 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 it's, it's the idea of contest is extremely, extremely important. You've heard me just use the illustration that, you know, when, when, when purchasing a house, we all know the three most important things, right? Location, location, and location, right? And when we're interpreting the Bible, we need to understand the three most important things is context, context, and context, because we need to make sure that what we are, what we are learning is, is consistent and harmoniously um, in, in, uh, in, the, in the context of the greater message of the scriptures, and so this morning, we're going to take a little bit of time and just consider some of the context here, because the other part of it is when we understand the context, we'll be able to know how and where to insert ourselves into the flow of the scripture. The book of Ephesians, like the other three quarters of the New Testament, is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, it was him that wrote this church to a, this letter to a church that was in Ephesus. Um, he claims ownership of this letter right in the beginning of the passage. If you're not there already, Ephesians chapter 1. Let's take a look together. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1. We're going to be going through um, Ephesians in, exposit in an expository kind of a way, which is really my favorite way to preach, uh, line by line, getting the full context of it. And so, um, uh, Paul, uh, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, claiming ownership, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see right from the beginning that, that this letter is being written by Paul and he's writing this letter to the saints in Ephesus, right? And so the saints are the Christians who, who have embraced Christ. It's important to note the disclaimer that Paul attaches to his position as an apostle. Look what he says here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. This is very significant. This is important for us to understand why he inserted that because, because of Paul's past as a persecutor of the church, right? Prior to him coming to faith in Christ, he was a, a zealous leader uh, and, and his name was Saul and he was persecuting the, Christ, the church of Jesus Christ and, and condoning the deaths of many in the church. And then he has this conversion experience on his way to Damascus to further the persecution efforts. And as a result of this, he, he obviously, God launches him into this incredible ministry, but everywhere Paul went, people questioned whether he should be the guy. I mean, like, who do you think you are? I mean, here's Paul preaching to a crowd of people, many of which have been widowed and orphaned because he kind of gave the approval to their death, right? And so, or locked them up or whatever. And so people always questioned Paul's apostleship. In fact, if you read through, Paul, through Paul's writings, you'll see that even Paul struggled with his past and, and recognized that I'm the least of the apostles and hey, I am who I am only by the grace of God. He recognized that he did nothing to deserve this seat at the table. And so he, 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 he qualifies his, his introduction, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. I'm not defined by my past. I'm defined by who God has made me. And so he kind of puts it right out there from the beginning. And, and this is a truth that, that Paul um, obviously has to apply to his life, but it also is something that he will um, communicate to the readers 
of this letter, a very important piece of information that they would not define themselves by their past, but they would see themselves as God sees them. And I'll unpack a little bit more of that as we, as we go forward. There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians. Uh, and really, these six chapters are broken up into two categories. Um, the theology that is found in the book of Ephesians is very rich, it's very deep, it's very formative. And, and the first three chapters, chapters one, two, and three, have to deal with our position in Christ. As I mentioned last week, it is the most critically important thing that we need to get deep in our knower, that we need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. Because when we know who we are in Jesus Christ, it it impacts the way in which we, we see ourselves and God and the world around us. And so this first part, the first three chapters has to do with our position in Christ. The second three chapters, four, five, and six, have to do with our practices in Christ. How do we live our lives in light of our position? Right, And so it is the fruit of understanding who we are. When we understand who we are in Christ, it will inform how we are to live our lives. What I love about the book of Ephesians is that it is immensely theological. I mean, the depths of where Paul will go in these passages of Scripture are mind-boggling and really hard for us to really wrap our our arms around in so many ways. And, And so it's really deep in theology, but then it is immensely practical. As we get into the later chapters, he starts talking about how husbands ought to respond to their wives, how wives ought to respond to their their, their husbands, how children are to respond to their parents, and he just kind of, in workers and employees, and it really gets extremely practical. But the practices of our faith need to flow out of and be informed by the position of of our faith, our awareness of who we are in Christ. And so we're going to kind of hold in proper tension those two pieces, right? Our Our position in Christ with our practices in Christ. It's very important to know when applying, when we consider, those two truths are really important to know when we consider this audience that... Paul is writing to. Um, The the goal of of what, there's a goal in Paul's mind in writing this letter and highlighting these two things, the position in Christ and the practices in in Christ. And so that's why it's important to understand our audience, what's going on, where are they coming from, where are they at in their journey. Um, At the time of the writing, it's about 60 to 62 AD, and Paul is writing this letter likely from a prison cell Um, And he's writing this letter to a church that is fairly new. Uh, It is a church that he had planted. He has relationship with them. And so there's a love that he has for this church. He's got a desire to see them thrive in everything that God has for them. And this church in in Ephesus, um, Ephesus was a a city in modern-day Turkey that, that Paul is writing to. And Paul is writing this letter to these new believers with the purpose of encouraging themselves, encouraging them <clears throat> to see themselves in an entirely new way since they've come in Christ. His, his, his big idea, his big goal is that they would understand and see themselves in an entirely new way now that they have come to Christ. You see, Ephesus was a city that was known for its idolatry. And his idol worship was, was, was you know, manifest everywhere they went. So all forms of, of pagan practices taking place everywhere, and everybody was involved in it. The philosophies, these pagan philosophies, entrenched the culture of Ephesus. Sexual perversion was, was, was rampant everywhere they went. And, and not only was it taking place in every place, every place possible, it was actually an expression of worship to the pagan gods. And so this was a very dark place. It was a, a, a place where um, these Christians now, these new Christians in Ephesus, now they're coming in from a culture like that a culture of total decadence, and and now as new creations in Christ Jesus, they're called to kind of come out of that culture, right? They're now, now they're called to see themselves as different than the world around them, to not be influenced by the world around them, the things that they were engaged in and experiencing, and Paul's encouraging them, that's not who you are anymore. 
And that sounded really good to them. I mean, that's what they signed up for. They knew that they were going to be different. They knew that they were embracing this this Savior, Jesus. They knew that it was a call to change. They embraced this. This They knew full well this is what they signed up for. The big question was, how do I do that? What does that look like? Where, Where do I even begin in this journey? Where do I start? You see, Paul wanted them to see themselves as people in Christ. People with a radically new identity in the midst of a crazy world. To see themselves as God sees them. People with a completely new identity lived out in the midst of a crazy, sinful world. You think there's some things we might be able to pick up from the pages of this book? I think that, that, that the many of the things that they are experiencing are the very same things that we are experiencing in our culture today, in the world in which we are experiencing as well. We too are, are surrounded by this anti-Christ culture that is steeped in celebrating sin, slaughtering children in sacrifice under the name of abortion, engaged in the most vile and decadent forms of sin. This is the world in which we live in. And this is the world in which we are called to be salt and light to. Their story is our story. It's interesting, if you look at what Paul, will go a little forward, a little bit further, Paul will mention in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, remember that you at one time were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I mean, Paul kind of lays it all out there and says to him, this is what you were, and I want to go on record, that was me as well. Alienated from God without hope. Without God in this world, that's what we were before we, came into, before we came to Christ. That's what we were. That's what our identity was. How we operated in that was the manifestations of that previous identity. But Paul's raising their awareness and saying, but that's not who you are anymore. He says, but now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who are once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's not what you are. Think about it. The first thing that happened in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did God do after he, he cast, you know, he, he, he sent judgment? He separated them out of the garden. They were drawn, they were drawn away, but now in Christ, the second Adam, because of the blood of Jesus Christ that's been shed, we are now called to draw near. God brings us back home, the restoration. We're not what we used to be. But how do I live this thing called Christianity out in a world that is clearly moving in an opposite direction? I I hate to sound like one of those doomsday preachers, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to get better in the world around us. Sin never gets better. Sin never cleans itself up. The re- we're just seeing the manifestation of sin over and over and over. Sin will always take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. And what we start seeing in our nation today, and what we start seeing in the world today, is the manifestation of a, of a nation and of a people who are apart from God. But like Esther, who recognized that God had put her where she was for such a time as this, you and I have been brought into the kingdom of God where we are for such a time as this. And we are not victims. Listen, we are not victims of our culture. We have before us the amazing opportunity to bring the hope that they're so desperately crying for. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And God can take that which was dead and make it alive again. And we have been entrusted and called to be lights in dark places. A lot of that, how we do this has to, how how do we do that? A lot of that has to do with how we see ourselves 
in Christ. I mentioned that last week, how, how critically important it is to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Because when you know who you are in Christ, you'll start living the life of Christ out in the world. That's what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is, listen, a Christian is not just what you believe. A Christian is allowing your life to be lived out based on what you believe, right? It's, it's having the fruit of that belief evidenced in the way in which we live our lives. The opposite is true as well. When you don't know who you are, then you don't realize you're a part of the family of God. You don't realize the, the blessings and you don't appreciate the goodness and the grace of God. There's a lot of Christians that are just kind of, like James, James kind of paints the picture of the, the double-minded man who's unstable in all of his ways, right? Being driven and tossed by the wind. And there's just so many Christians that, that are just like a ping pong ball going back between the, the ups and the downs. And it's kind of like, no, you need to know who you are in Jesus Christ. Stop being a victim of the lies of the enemy. You are his, right? And when we don't understand that we fall prey to this mindset that we just never feel comfortable in the presence of God. We never feel accepted by God. We never feel comfortable in the presence of the people of God. We just kind of always feel like we're on the outside looking in, never really experiencing sonship the way you and I should be experiencing sonship. It has to do with not understanding who we are in Christ. And you'll never feel like you fit in and therefore never thrive in the family of God the way God designed for that to be. I read a great story years back in Christianity Today that I want to share with you. Steve May writes that. He says, Quincy was on death row when I first met him. As I walked the long hallway past the dozens of others facing imminent demise, Quincy watched me through the bars of his cage. Right away I knew he was the one I came for. I paid the animal shelter $50 and took Quincy home with me. So we're talking about a dog. It's like, okay. Adjusting to our family wasn't easy for him as I thought it would be. He must have been abused in the past because he cowered every time I approached him. And even though I saved him from the gas chamber with the intention of, of feeding him and playing with him and loving him and even spoiling him, he always ran away when I approached him. Eventually, he stopped trying to run away and instead he developed a different problem, acute separation anxiety. I guess he decided since he's not going to be going away, neither should anybody else and everybody ought to always stay close. He goes on to say, every time we'd pack a suitcase, Quincy would go a little nuts. He would shadow my wife's every step, and if we stepped outside, even for a moment, he would begin to whine and cry and pace. Clearly, Quincy had some abandonment issues to deal with. He said, if I could speak Quincy's language, I'd say, relax. Everything is going to be okay. You're a part of our family now and we will take care of you. Whatever happened in the past year is over. You're with us now. Your life is different. Enjoy it. That's what I would say if I could speak dog. Unfortunately, I don't. And then when I say it in English, he doesn't understand. And so for at least now, Quincy remains a little neurotic. He goes on to say that in the church, I have met many Quincy's. In fact, there have been times in my own spiritual life when I have related to God exactly the way Quincy related to us. Timid, cowering, wanting to run away, yet afraid of being abandoned, and not having a clue about what it means to be a part of the family of God. Maybe you see yourself in that story. Maybe you know somebody who struggles to receive that unconditional acceptance from God. That's why Paul is writing this letter to the church at Ephesus. To encourage and equip and inform them that they are not what they were. They are in Christ. 
And when you're in Christ, everything changes. You're a part of a very different family. Everything has changed. You see, Paul is addressing this group of, of former sinners, idolaters, people who were formerly disconnected from the life of God, people who struggled to see themselves as God saw them based on their former life as well as based on the present struggles that they had. This was, this was the audience to whom Paul is writing this letter to. And he encourages this group of people in the opening in verse two, he says, to that group of audience, to that audience, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Take it easy. To this audience that just didn't know where they fit in the puzzle, God says, Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. It's the currency of redemption. It means God's unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor extended to you and I solely on the merits of Christ's work and in accordance with the purpose of God. It means God chose us because of Christ and brought us into the family. We were just that Quincy behind the bars. And maybe, maybe you're a Quincy today. He says, grace to you. And then he says, look, peace from God the Father. Peace with God is the result of the grace of God. Right? We don't experience peace with God apart from the grace of God. When we have the grace of God, then and only then, because the last thing we experience, the last thing humanity will experience apart from Jesus Christ is peace with God. Apart from Jesus Christ, man is born under the wrath of God, the enemies of God, separated from God, heading to a Christless hell. But by the grace of God, solely on the merits of Christ, we are drawn near. And so peace with God is a result of the grace of God. And as I started to say, maybe you're a Quincy today. Feeling like you're on the outside. Maybe, maybe you've been abused. Maybe you've been mistreated or uncared for or, or timid. Maybe you're a bit neurotic about your relationship with God. Maybe you're kind of seeing God in heaven and, and like you have this idea that it's kind of like, you know, God just is weighing out whether he likes you or not based on what you do. I accept you today. I don't accept you tomorrow. Right? He loves me. He loves me. Now, that's not how God operates. That might have been your experience. That might have been how some important person communicated love or lack thereof to you, and I'm so sorry if that's been your reality, Quincy. But that's not how God operates. That's not who God is. Because what Paul does to this group of people, this audience in Ephesus, who, who measured their acceptance by God based on their past experiences and their current struggles, Paul addresses that audience by going and saying, listen, all right, let's, let's pull back from what you've done and let's look at the timeline of your life and let's go a little further back than your timeline to a time before time existed. Before you draw conclusions about how God sees you based on what you've done, let's zoom out over the timeline and go back to a time before time existed. Let, let me give you a little perspective, is what Paul is saying, about God's commitment to you. That's where we started going last week, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So God, it's like Paul zooms out over the timeline and says, Yo, let's start all the way back to before the foundations of the world. I alluded to this last week. I want to go a little bit deeper with you this morning on that. Every blessing that God has for us is tied to our position in Christ. 
Therefore, to the degree that we were living out our new identity is the degree that we will experience the blessings that God has for us. It's not that the blessings aren't available to us, but when we are not walking in Christ and living as the new creations, we're not going to experience the blessings of God. And there is a lot of what Christians experience today because they have their own plan. Right? They jump out from what they are in Christ to what they used to be, and they try to employ those same actions from the past and wonder, why isn't God blessing me? Because the blessings that are yours are in Christ, and when we're in Christ, we're walking in the blessings of God. And that's why the scriptures call us to, to live a certain way and to avoid certain things and, and, and to obey the, the principles and the, and, and, the, and the commands of Scripture, not because God is trying to rob us of having a good time, but God is looking to protect us so that we don't forfeit the blessings that he has for us. And so these blessings are, are directly tied to our position in Christ. And so the location of the blessings are not tied to your path, but Christ's path because we're in Christ. As I mentioned last week, some of those are realized immediately. Some of the, that, that joy, that acceptance, that comfort, that love we experience at the moment that, that we have embraced him as Lord and Savior, some of it will be experienced at a later date when the presence of sin is gone from the earth, where we stand before him and, and, and we have been, and, and the power of sin has been removed from our life and, and we are living in the presence of God as we were designed to. And so the fullness of the blessings that are already mine will be realized at that day. Some of them I'm experiencing now now, some of them I'll experience later, but they're all mine, and they will be there forever. Let's take a look here at verse 4, because that, that's the area that causes sometimes some tension for people. Um, look at verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. You know, at first reading, it appears that what the author is saying is that God, apart from any involvement of us whatsoever, chose us before we were even born. That's what it appears to say at first reading. However, after further reading and comparing it with other texts, I am convinced that that's exactly what Paul is saying in this text. There is no room for ambiguity. It says what it means. It means what it says, that you and I were chosen before the foundation of the world, before you were even born, apart from your own decision. You have not chosen Christ. He has chosen you. There's no getting around that. And just because it's hard for us to reconcile that in our minds and understand that. I want to go on record and say, I don't understand that, but I don't want to serve a God who I can understand everything, right? Because that would just put me a step below him, and I'm far lower in my intellect than that. And so what oftentimes happens is we look at that and say, that doesn't make sense, and so we take a text out of context, it becomes a pretext, and to try and satisfy our curiosity. I was saying to somebody the other day, I, I, the, the longer I'm in the faith and the longer I'm in the ministry, the more comfortable I'm saying things like, I don't know. And I'm finding comfort in that. And I feel like I knew a lot more when I was younger <laughs> than I know now. And it's because I, I just, because these, we're trying to understand the mind of God. And when we try to understand the mind of God, then we must reduce them to something we can understand. And when we reduce them to something we can understand, he's no longer God. He's just a better version of, us, of ourselves. You see, context is really important because we gotta remember the audience. Paul brings this group of people who are struggling with their, their worthiness. It says, hey, before you were even born, before you even took part in that which would exclude you, that, which is, that being birth, before any of that happened, you need to know that the eternal God who stands over time saw you and chose you before the foundation of the world. He said, you are mine. Paul dismantles the argument that they had anything to do with their salvation and puts all the effort, all of the choosing, all of the work 
on Christ before the foundation of the world. You say, yeah, but didn't, didn't I choose God? I, I did. I chose him, but here's the thing. Before I chose him, he chose me, and he chose me in such a way that my response to him was not robotic. It was genuinely a choice, but I was made alive so that I can choose him. Before that, as we'll see you later on, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And last I checked, dead people don't choose anything. And so he makes me alive based on his choice before the foundation of the world, and he makes me alive, and I say, well, I choose him. And like God said, of course you do. It's because I chose you first. He goes further on in saying this in, the, in verse four. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us. Oh, there we go. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. I talked a little bit about this last week. He, he predestined us for adoption. This is all tied to our being chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Can I tell you how many churches and how many Christians have divided over what that means? I think it's so sad to think how many churches have, have divided over this idea of predestination. But there's a big piece here that we need to take note of in verse five here when we look at, because here's the thing, we read about, you know, before the foundation of the world, he chose us, he predestined us. We get caught up in those big words because it makes us, here, I'll just, I'll just here's the disclaimer, this is where people have a hard time with it. Well, if he chose me, but well, what about that person? He didn't choose that person, that's another conversation for another day. I just need to be caught up in the fact that he chose me. I don't, that's, I got enough to try to embrace just with that. But see, when I see those words, it, it, it seems to sh- overshadow something else that Paul says in this text here. Look at verse 5. It says, it's done according to the purpose of his will. It's done according to the purpose of his will. In other words, it's not my will, but it's his will. Again, this is very important to encourage and encouraging to hear when you're the person who is aware that you don't have the kind of, of life and worthiness that's acceptable before God, right? These are the ones who are coming out of their past and going, I'm an absolute mess. There's no way that God can ever choose me. And Paul's like, no, 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 let me tell you something. Before you even became a mess, God chose you before the foundation of the world. And he said, you're mine. And you see, when we understand that and we understand what Christ has done for us and we understand our position before God, it will inform the way we live our lives. And look what he says in verse six. This is so heavy. This is so good. Look, he says in verse six, this is all done. Why? To the praise of his glorious grace. Soloi Deo Gloria to the glory of God alone. You and I live to the glory of God alone. It is all about him. He is the one who is God. I am the recipient of his blessings. I'm the recipient of his grace. I'm in, I am the recipient of all these wonderful things, but I am not the cause. I am not the purpose. The purpose is the glory of God. And see, here, here's where we're, we're, we're Christians need to really, and I think perhaps some of our um, American mindset, but this is, this is a global problem. Too many times we, we think that our salvation revolves around us. Like it's all about our story. It's all about me. It's about how I'm blessed, how, I'm, how I ought to be happy, how I ought to be, you know, be on the receiving. And it's kind of like we, we think that our salvation is all about us. And so we've got this picture of Jesus knocking on the door, praying and pleading, would you please come to me? That is not the picture of Jesus in the scriptures. Because what we see in the scriptures is God chose us before the foundation of the world. And we are in him accepted. And you see, but too many times we think we're at the center of that. And here's the problem. When we think we're at the center of it, when things don't go our way, we're disappointed and we think something's wrong with God. Well, why didn't you answer my prayer? Why didn't you meet my need? Why didn't you do this? And God's kind of like, last I checked, it wasn't really about you. All of this 
choosing and predestination was done to the praise of his glorious grace. And so I'm just the recipient of the greatest gift. I get to enjoy and be in the presence of a God who loves me. I don't deserve it. And to the degree that I don't understand it, and to the degree that I don't deserve it, I, I realize that I don't deserve it is the degree that I love him more, and I'm a whole lot more patient with other people, by the way. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. It's that one who realizes how poor we are. We bring nothing to the table but our sin. There's nothing we can do. And so this isn't about us. Our salvation is not about our story. It's about God's story. Our story gets included into God's story, but it's not the main part. It's about him and him alone. Our salvation is not about us, it's about Christ. It's about the story of God. It's about what he's doing. Jesus kind of gives us some really good insight. I know I'm going a bit longer, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, <laughs> John chapter six, I won't be much longer. John chapter six, look, look what Jesus says. He just, he just gives us a picture of what it's all about. He's like, let, let me just kind of, you know, remember like the Wizard of Oz, like a peek behind the curtain. Let me just kind of show you what the story's about here. Let me just give you a picture of what's going on here. Jesus says in John chapter six, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from, the he from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Let's just stop there for a moment. Look what Jesus is saying here. All that the Father gives me. What is, what is the all? It's you and me. That's what, the, that's what he's talking. He's talking about the, the, the bride of Christ, right? The church, those who will, who will come to Christ. All that the Father gives to me, they will not not. Hopefully they will. No, they will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast them out. For I have come down from heaven, not to start a religion, right? Not to do my own will, but what? To do the will of him who sent me. Well, what's the will of him who sent me? Here it is. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. What he's saying is, my, the will of God the Father for me is to take that which the Father has given to me, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus is going to bring us with him. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then he says in verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Being confident of this very thing, Paul says in Philippians chapter four, uh, chapter one, that he who began a good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Why? Because before the foundation of the world, God said, you're mine, Quincy. Sadly, some ascribe this teaching to a French theologian from the, seven, uh, from the 1500s called, named John Calvin. Some of you have checked out already and said, oh, he's one of those Calvinists. I'm going to go on record and say, I am not a Calvinist. I would not let some theologian from the 1500s rob me or take from me a passage of scripture that Jesus said. This is not Calvinism, this is Bible. There are things that I have appreciated and, and understand and, and, and agree with, on Cal with Calvin on, and there's some things I don't agree with Calvin on. I'm not a Calvinist, I am a Christian. And as a Christian, I'm going to be informed not by some dead theologian from the 1500s, but by the word of God that is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And see, the problem is when we start to ascribe labels to things, we diminish the truth of what's being said because what ends up happening, as soon as this gets seen as Calvinism, we start going, well, you know what? I know a Calvinist and that guy or that girl, and then just go on, and then we start saying, no, 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 that, that's not what we want to do. I'm not a Calvinist. I have no desire to be a Calvinist. I'm a, I'm a biblicist, right? I, I believe, I, I'm a Christian, and I believe in the word of God. 
And you see, Paul, when, when communicating the position that we have in Christ to the church at Ephesus, Ephesus and all of us who read on today, he encourages the disqualified by saying, don't count yourself out. If you're in Christ, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And before you even had the opportunity to count yourself out, he counted you in before the foundation of the world. And so Quincy, you've been adopted. Quincy, you have been chosen. Quincy, you have been purchased. Quincy, you have been loved. Quincy, you have been accepted. Quincy, you're a part of the family of God. And don't let any past experience or any past role model, model paint a picture for you of what God is like. You're his. And nothing will snatch you out of his hand. That's positional truth. And when we understand positional truth, it'll affect everything in every way in which we live our lives. Because it's all tied to being in Christ. We're gonna journey and we're gonna journey deep through the pages of this book. We're gonna expose some lies that have, have been embraced and have caused confusion for so many. We're going to allow the word of God to form our theology. Not different people's preferences, but the word of God. Would you journey with me? Would you be open to the Holy Spirit teaching you through the pages of the book, keeping it in proper context and allowing us to experience all that Christ has for us? Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I know for some, this is the first time they've ever heard anything like this. For others, it's a great reminder. For others, it shakes them to their core. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would, um, that you'd allow the truth of your word to find place in our hearts and that we would, um, uh, that we would experience what I believe the readers of uh, the church of Ephesus, Ephesus experienced, that we've been accepted by you. Because in the end of the day, that's what this is all about just being accepted by you on the merits of Christ. And we thank you for that. We commit all these things into your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Yes. Amen.